the book of Colossians, chapter number 3. Now, we have been studying the New Testament for the last 12 years. We started in Romans 12 years ago, so I guess we've still got to go back and do um, Acts <laughs> and the Gospels, although we have, I think we've done the Gospels. It's uh, at least uh, the Gospel of John and I think the Gospel of Mark we went through as well. And, uh, of course, we're up through Philemon. The next book is going to be Hebrews, but we, Brother Jamie did Colossians, and I didn't want, I wanted to do the whole set, so I had to go back and do Colossians. Of course, he did Colossians a few years ago. So we're doing Colossians, and when we get finished with Colossians, then we're going to go on to Hebrews. Now, I've never, I've never taught, I've never preached through Hebrews before, so that's, and that's a very, uh, maybe one of the most difficult books, because there's some very difficult passages in it, so it's going to be uh, a challenge. And then when we get through Hebrews, then we'll be into what they call the general epistles, James, First and Second Peter, First and Second and Third John, Jude, and then Revelation. And I'm looking forward to that. I saw a cartoon one time when the guy was preaching through the Bible and they thought he was going to retire after he got through Revelation. When we get through Revelation, we'll do something else, but uh, looking forward to that. And I'm really thinking about doing a study on eschatology or prophecy, the second coming. That's been a wee way. I don't like to get too far away from that subject. And uh, so, looking forward to that. We'll preach that, Lord willing, on Sunday mornings. But tonight, Colossians chapter 3. Now, our text this evening is verse 5 through 9, but we need to read the context. And so let's read from verse 1 through verse 9 this evening. Colossians 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Now, Heavenly Father, we ask you to be our helper tonight. And Lord, to allow your Holy Spirit, who lives in each of, each of us, your believers, to be our teacher Lord, the Holy Spirit wrote these words, all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so, Lord, may the author be our interpreter tonight and our illuminator and our applier of these truths to our lives. Lord, we live in difficult times, but they've always been difficult. And your word is always the same. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to understand it tonight and apply it to our lives. And uh, Lord, there may be someone tonight who hears something this evening that would just possibly save their life and save uh, their marriage, uh, save the, the blessings that you have for them. And so, Lord, may you help us to be attentive this evening, help us to get something out of this, and help us, Lord, to be willing to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Lord, thank you tonight. We love you. Thank you for this wonderful day. And thank you for our visitors being here with us today. And thank you for each one. We ask now your blessings and help and your presence with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, last time we saw that the believer is dead. Now, it's interesting because the verse starts out, if you then be risen with Christ. But in verse 3 it says, for you are dead. So how can you be risen and dead at the same time? Well, we're dead unto this world and alive unto the next world. And that's what baptism represents it represents death and burial, but also resurrection. We're dead to our old life and alive unto the new life that God has created in us. We're dead to the world. We're alive unto God. And so that's our position. That's what God says. That's where we live. That's our position with God. And what he's trying to do here in this chapter is move toward uh, our practice. How does this practically work out in our day-to-day -day lives? And so we've entitled the message tonight, Killing the dead man, because the Bible says we are dead. But when you get to verse 5, it says mortify or put to death certain things in our lives. And so in these first four verses, we find that we are indeed dead to this life. 
I want you to look at verse 3 again. He says, For your dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And we made much of this last week, uh, helping us to understand that um, a lot of times in this life, you're, you're not going... Now, we talked about contentedness today. Uh, but, you know, part of our contentedness is realizing that we're waiting, that our life is hid, that our life is on hold, uh, that really uh, we're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. We saw that Abraham illustrated these truths because even though Abraham was a rich man, he could have built a, a mansion and he didn't build a house. He lived in a tent the whole time he was here, even though he could have put roots down. In other words, he was satisfied. He was thankful. He was content and contented with just a tent to live in because because he was looking to the future. He knew what was coming. And he was not satisfied in the sense with this is all there is. If this, you know, Paul says, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. Listen, the Christian life is always putting things in context. And if it's not for eternity, if it's not for the world that's coming, then we would be of all men most miserable. But listen, we can wait. We, because of what's coming. Um, listen, we can put up with all, we can have contentedness in all kinds of situations in life, even the, the difficult situations in life, because we know it's temporary. And God keeps his best for last. And that's what he says in verse 4, when Christ, now it's not if Christ, but when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. And again, we have no idea how wonderful it is. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And so, um, by the way, that's why I like to look at prophecy about what's happening in the future. Um, and the, the Bible gives you a lot of detail about that. It's good to use your imaginations about what's happening in the future, just like we use our imaginations for what happened in the past and the Old Testament stories and the New Testament stories. You use, use your imagination to fill out the details in that, and we do the same thing. And But it's good to be looking, you see, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we're looking forward, and it's important that we do so. But what about... You know, the sweet by and by, yeah, but what about the nasty now and now? What are you going to do till then? You see, and that's why he says in these early verses, he says, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And so, really and truly, we should be heavenly-minded people. This world, like Abraham, should have very loose bonds to us. We are strangers and pilgrims. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And so what does he, well, there's two words that we get in these verses, verse 5 to verse 9, that I want us to consider. And we would do more verses, but when you get these lists, then you have to slow down a wee bit, and you've got to look at each word. And uh, he's going to, there's two words we're going to look at, or two phrases. One is, mortify therefore your members, mortify. And the second thing we're going to look at is put off. You're putting off the old man. And then next time we're going to talk about putting on. And you see, God just doesn't get rid of stuff. He replaces stuff. <laughs> you know, I don't go to the bar anymore. Okay? <laughs> don't really want to go. But God replaced that bar family with church family. So I go to church. Other people go to the bar. I go to church. People have to get drunk to get happy. I don't, I don't have to get drunk to be happy anymore. And so uh, God... Uh, helps us to put off some things and then to put on some things. And we'll talk about the putting on uh, a little later on. But let's look at this idea of mortify. Look at verse 5 again. He says, mortify therefore. Okay, now wait a minute. The therefore has to do with the first four verses. Because you're dead positionally, it must and it has to and it should affect your life practically every day. In other words, you should live like a dead man. Now you're not going to be dead forever. Because the best is coming. When Christ appears, then shall we appear with him in glory. But in this life, we forego. In this life, we refuse. In this life, we deny ourselves sin and the pleasures of sin because this is not our home. And we don't set our affection here on things on this earth, but our eyes are upon heaven. And I'm going to tell you something. It's a lot sweeter in heaven. It's a lot cleaner in heaven. And the joy that God gives us in heavenly things is everlasting joy. The Bible says there's pleasures in sin for a season. But you know, Ab uh, Moses refused those pleasures for a season for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. In other words, he says, you know, what, what is, what is uh, temporary pleasure in this life? 
You know, 70, 80 years of temporary pleasure and then eternally without Christ. Or to deny yourself uh, and because we belong to him and we, uh, we want to love and to please him. And so we're not going to get embroiled with the devil's uh, playground and, 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 and put our roots down in this world. No, our, our hearts are where he is. Lay up your treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. For where your treasure is, there, uh, where, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So our minds and our hearts and our affection and our gaze should always be upon heaven. And there's no comparison, friend. God always gives his best to those who leave the choice with him. So he says, because of what you, you, you learn in verse 1 to 4, be, mortify therefore. In other words, in your practical day-to-day life, there's things that you have to kill. There's things that you have to put to death. You see, life is about choices. Every day you have choices. And those choices we make, uh, we live with. And what the Bible is teaching us in this blueprint for life, he's basically saying make the right choices. In the life that you have right now, make the right choices and avoid the bad choices. Now, all of us have made bad choices, and we remember what that felt like. It's not, it's not good. It's not happy. You sow way way loads, you reap way loads. You reap what you sow. And most of us have lived long enough to understand that lesson, that it's really important, the choices that we make. And God helps us with this. And so the first thing he says is mortify, mortify, therefore, your members. Because we're dead, because our life is hidden, because we're willing to wait for the life that's coming, then in a practical way we're to put to death the things in this life that are against God and his purpose for our lives. So we want, he wants us to live like our position in a practical way. Well, let's look at the, some of the, the principles of just putting to death before we get into the specifics here. Look over at the book of Romans. The book of Romans deals with this as well. Now, Romans is the first of Paul's letters, not the first one that he wrote, but the first one that's in the canon of Scripture. And it's there for purpose because it lays out systematically condemnation, justification, sanctification, glorification. And then, of course, then there's a dispensational section, 9, 10, and 11. When you get to chapter 12 to 16, that's the practical section. But he talks about sanctification in chapters 6 and 7. And I just wanted to point point out a few things. Look at chapter 6 of Romans and verse 6. He says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Listen, when you got saved... You were saying bye to sin, and you were saying uh, hello to God. You were uh, the, the, the whole idea of repentance is a change of direction. You know, we have to turn from sin to God, the Bible says. And that's what happened when we got saved. And we said no to what we were, and yes to what God would have us to be. And so, uh, you know, the, our baptism illustrates that. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, now watch, we also should walk in newness of life. A man who is saved should have a new life. Therefore, finally, man, be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. But look down at verse 11. He says, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead. Mortify therefore your members. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. So we're dead, but we're, we're risen. We're dead to the old life. We're alive to the new life. We're dead to sin. We're alive to God. And so he says, uh, verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Did you know that there's a big response? Now God saves us from the penalty of sin. But if you're to be free from the power of sin, that's a choice that you and I make. And the Bible says here in verse 12 that we are not to allow sin to reign in our mortal body. We have the ability and the choice to put sin to death in our lives. When a choice comes up where we uh, have a temptation to sin, we get to choose. And God says that in our minds, we should have already made up that choice that when it raises its head, we're going to cut it off. We're going to mortify. We're going to put to death. We're going to squeeze the oxygen out of that thing. We're not going to let it live in our lives. Don't let sin reign in your body. Don't let sin have its way in your life. Verse 13, 
Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness on the sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under law but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Now watch verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You let sin have its way with you, and friend, you will not be able to uh, break that. Sin, when it gets a hold of you, sin will, will take you further than you want to go. It'll make you pay more than you want to pay. It'll make you stay longer than you want to stay. We are not to give the devil an inch. And we must um, fervently, because of what he's done for us, be motivated in our hearts to kill sin in our lives. We've got to kill sin in our lives before sin in our lives kills us. And it will. You let sin have its way. The ultimate uh, result and the end of sin is death. Even for the Christian. Now you, you won't lose your salvation. But it will destroy your life. And I could tell, I could tell you story after story after story. Of, of, of believers. Many of them younger than me. Who are in heaven tonight. Because sin destroyed their lives. You see you see it once. Plan A for Satan is to get your soul. And when you get saved that's spoiled. So he moves on to plan B. Plan B is your life. He wants to ruin your life. He wants to ruin your family. And uh, the Lord is saying, don't let him do it. And here's how you, here's how you uh, not let him do it. In verse 5, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Put sin to death um, in your life. Now verse 5, the emphasis as you read through this, um, em the emphasis really here is on sexual sins. And when you think of... Um, Sexual sins, um, crimes, many crimes of passion result from sexual sins. Um, you know, somebody goes off and commits adultery. Well, then the the husband who is the innocent party, the husband who has been offended, his anger overcomes him. He grabs a gun. He goes out, and a lot of things you see on the news where people get killed is because of what we're talking about here tonight. They didn't, they didn't kill sin in their lives, and sin has killed them because they've got involved in sexual sins, and it has is, it is aroused uh, crimes of passion, and it leads to other things. You would be surprised how much of that is connected together. It's really, really serious. The book of Proverbs talks about it. We don't have time to get into all that, but it's really, really serious. But the, when you read this, we're going to read it now, and we're going to see a connection here. There's, there's a progression that we see, and he ends with the the doorway to these sins. But he deals, first of all, with the, the, the most serious part of that. And so let's read verse 5. He says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And he starts with fornication, then uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now we're going to look at those individually and see how they connect together. The first one is fornication. And fornication is sexual immorality. Um, it, all, it includes adultery. Usually when you think of fornication, it's, it's uh, unlawful relations between unmarried people. But it also in, involves all kinds of uh, sexual promiscuity and immorality. Now, you would think, you know, when I, when I, when I was growing up, uh, the, the, the grown-ups... Uh, this was this was like part of society. It was part of the fabric. You didn't have to say this. Everybody knew that it was wrong to have intimate relations with someone who is not your wife or your husband. That marriage is the only place for intimate relations like that. And it needs to be said today over and over and over again to everybody's ears because our society is bombarding us with lies. And the truth of the matter is, it is not okay to have sex with someone other than your wife or husband. There must be control of sexual desires and appetites. They're very, very powerful, very, very strong. And we have got to pay attention to these things. By the way, not just as adults, but our young people growing up. 
They have to be taught. Uh, many, now, the school wants to teach them, and the, the society teaches them, and, and everything on uh, television is teaching them the wrong things. We have got to teach moral purity and cleanness to our children and our young people. They have to understand that it is wrong. It is wrong to touch someone of the opposite sex in that way. It is absolutely wrong. And you are playing with fire. Proverbs says that, can, you, can a man take fire in his bosom and not be burned? Oh, friend, that the, the tragedy and the destruction that this will leave. Because let me tell you something, the things that you decide about and the things that you do in your life, even as a young person, will stay with you the rest of your life. It's very, very important. It's important that they hear it at church. It's important and even more important that they hear it in the home. Moms and dads, you've got to teach your kids when they're growing up that it's not okay. They must, they must, they must keep themselves um, forsaking all others, keep themselves only to their husband or their wife. So very important. Now we, we live in a time when this is this is laughed at. Uh, someone thinks, well, I'm engaged, and they think that engagement is marriage in some way. Well, we're engaged, so we get to live together. Wrong, 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 wrong. It's wrong. We used to call it living in sin. And the Bible says here, now you see, that's part of the fabric of the world, but he's, he's talking to Christians here. And the, the heathen of Colossae and Ephesus and all the uh, New Testament churches, the church of Corinth, for example, was exposed to all kinds of uh, sexual immorality. And the Apostle Paul here, the Holy Spirit, using him to say, kill that sin. Kill it. Because it will kill you if you don't kill it. Fornication is wrong. The next word that he uses is uncleanness. Now, in uncleanness here means moral impurity. Now, the fornication is the deed. It's the act. Now, Jesus said, if a man looks upon a woman to look the lust after he's committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, you understand what he's doing there. Uh, he's helping them to see what the true standard of God's righteousness is. They thought they were righteous. God says, no, you might not be doing the deed, but you're doing the act in your mind. Um, you might not be murdering a person, but you hate that person as much that if you could get away with it and no one found out, you would murder them because you've already done it in your heart. And Jesus is going to the very thought of the person. Now, I was, I was reminded by a man in, in Northern Ireland. It's important that we don't... Um, equate the two um, in other words the the deed is more serious than the thought okay understand that some people say well if, if, if looking is the same as doing it then we might as well do it no 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 oh, listen it is far far worse listen I would rather somebody hit me than somebody put a gun to my head and kill me all right it's, it's worse to do the deed than it is to think about the deed. But what Jesus was saying is when you're talking about the righteousness of God, when you, when you think it in your mind, you are guilty, guilty, guilty. That's the point he was making. And this word uncleanness is about what's going on in your mind. Fornication is the deed. Uncleanness is the thought, the moral impurity. Now, this is a very strong word. This is very strong. This is the step right before fornication. This has to do with an impure mind. This has to do with impure thoughts, impure words, impure conversations, with no standards and no boundaries. Uh, someone who doesn't know how to say no to something. Jesus talked about those whose eyes were full of adultery. They were looking for it. They were thinking about it. That's all they thought about you know, we live in an age when pornography is, is rampant and it's all over the place. And the studies they've done on it and Christians are involved with it too. It's so easy to be accessed anymore. But it's going to mess with your mind. It will mess with your soul and your relationship with God. But someone who is involved in uncleanness is absolutely open to all of that. Get all I can get. Open to all of that, in cleanness, in moral, uh, moral impurity in your minds. And your and see, what are we talking about here? He said, listen, seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above. In other words, get your minds on heaven. Get it out of the gutter. Don't let your mind get in the gutter. We're not of this world. We're not of the gutter. 
We're of heaven. We shouldn't be involved in those things. The next word is inordinate affection. Now, inordinate affection means unbridled lust. It's the word pathos where we get the word passion from. And what it means it's, is now we're, we're, there's a progression. I'm going to put this together for you in just a minute. But there's a progression here. And what this is, it's not just lust. It's lust that is unbridled. And so when your lust is unbridled, and, and, and we'll see the progression here in just a moment, but it means that we act on those lusts. It means that we're, uh, there's no boundaries. We don't say no. Uh, the same word in ordinate affection is used over in Romans. Look at Romans chapter 1 and uh, verse number 26. This is speaking about those in Romans 1 and 2. is talking about our, our need, our depravity. Um, our condemnation, and then it gets to chapter 3, he talks about our salvation. Um, in verse uh, 26, it says, For this cause God gave them, gave them over to vile affections. That's the same word, inordinate affection. Vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly. And so that's speaking about homosexuality. And, you know, who knows where the thought comes from, but the thought, and we'll get to that next word, but the thought comes, and when people should guard their minds and say, no. No, what happens with these people is they have inordinate affection, vile affections, and it's unbridled, and they allow themselves to think of these things and be involved in those desires, and one thing leads to another. So God gives them over. You give yourself over, you give yourself over long enough and God will give you over. Well, the next word is the word evil concupiscence in verse number five. And this means, this is the Greek word apithumos. Api means upon and thumos is desire or lust. And it means to set your heart upon your lust. Okay. So here comes the thought. You know, someone once said you can't stop birds flying over your head, but you can stop them nesting in your hair, right? But here's a person that allows the bird to land on his head, and he allows it. He sets his heart upon that thing. And so <clears throat> it's a forbidden longing. And then the word before that is what we talked about this morning, which is covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, covetousness is a desire for more, or it is a desire to go beyond what God has designed, or it is a desire to go beyond what God has provided. It means that we're not satisfied with his provision, and we want more. In other words, we know better, we more, know more than God, or we care for ourselves more than God. Because if God really cared for us, then he would give us more. And friend, let me tell you something. If he doesn't give it to you, if he doesn't provide it, you don't need it. And if you get it, it'll hurt you. It's kind of like the children of Israel who wanted uh, the meat in the, in the, in the, in the desert. Do you remember this, this light bread that our soul loads at the manna? And so uh, God gave them quail. He gave them burnt and they were, they were knee deep in it. And they ate so much that they, they vomited it. Uh, you know, be careful what you're... Listen... The best life is the life that God has for you. Whatever, feed me with food convenient for me. Whatever God wants for you, that is the best life. And he loves you. And don't seek more than what he would uh, provide for you. And so here, I want, look at verse 5. Now, here's the progression. Now, it starts with the most serious thing. But I want you to see where it starts. It starts with covetousness, where a man is unthankful, where a man is not contented. And he has a longing and a yearning. And so then it moves from covetousness to evil concupiscence. In other words, it goes from covetousness uh, to forbidden longings. And he starts to long for things that is not in the plan of God for him. And then the next thing is he sets his heart upon them and has on, and then unbridled, unrestrained lusts. And then the next thing is uh, on cleanness, where now his, because he's given, he's, he's thought about this thing, then he, instead of guarding his heart against it, instead of putting it to death, he's entertained it, and now the thing has taken a life of its own, and now he's set his heart upon it, now he's controlled by it, now his mind is filled with it, he's filled with uncleanness, and then the next thing, he starts acting what he's thinking about. There's a progression here, 
and it goes from covetousness to fornication. And God says, kill it, kill it, kill it. And you know where we say kill it? Uh, we're in the covetous part, right? Kill it right there. Nip it in the bud. Don't allow our minds to be filled with worldly things that take us away and ruin our fellowship with God. He says, mortify it, put it to death. Starve it from oxygen. Don't let it live. When it raises its head, stomp on it immediately. Nip it in the bud. Don't let it get a hold in your life because it will ruin the Christian. Now in verse 6, he talks about how serious these things are. In verse number 6, he says, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In other words, this sin brings wrath. And he's speaking about the children of disobedience, which is the unsaved. Go back to uh, Ephesians, just back a few pages to Ephesians. Now, I don't like preaching about stuff like this. It makes you uncomfortable, doesn't it? it? makes me uncomfortable. But you know what? Sometimes we just have to stir at stuff like this and say, you know what? Those temptations are out there. The possibility is out there. And we've got to guard. We've got to make the right decisions, avoid the wrong decisions in life every single day. Kill the dead man every day. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verses uh, 1 to 4, uh, he says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In other words, this is what we were before we got saved. We were children of the devil, controlled by him. Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation and time past. Notice the time past thing. And that's where it ought to be. If, if, these, if these things that he's describing here, you know what we're talking about. It should be something in your past, not something in your present, not something in your future. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past and the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We were the children of disobedience, we're the children of wrath. Now we'll see in just a minute what wrath is, but wrath is the, is the anger of God manifest, and it's the, it's the judgment of God. And thank God that's, it's in the past there, in verse 4 is the pivot point where he says, but God, aren't you glad for that? But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, he, he saved us from that. And so what he's saying here, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Um, listen, that's, this is serious stuff. This is, these are sins that people will suffer in hell for. These are sins that Jesus suffered upon the cross for. These are serious things with God. And we have to, we have to acknowledge that they're serious. And that's what he's saying. Hey, listen, these, for, these, for which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience for these things. Verse 7, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. He says, you might have walked in those things and that was it described your life. You lived in them, you walked in them, you enjoyed them, you were proud of them. But let me tell you something, when you get saved, you can't be proud of sin like this anymore. You can't walk in it and enjoy it. No, God will, God will chasten you. He'll chasten you on the inside, he'll chasten you on the outside, but you cannot sin like this. And feel the same way about it before, uh, as you did before you got seen. Look, look over to Ephesians chapter 4. Many of the themes and Colossians you'll find in Ephesians. Ephesians was written at the same time to a neighboring city of Ephesus. And many of the uh, teachings and principles uh, are common in both of the books. But in Ephesians 4, look at verse 17. He says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. He said, listen, you're different. Don't you live like an unsafe person? Because the unsafe person hasn't had happened to them what has happened to you. They're in darkness. They're, they're blinded. Uh, they're controlled by Satan and controlled by the flesh. He says, uh, don't you walk like that? Verse 19, who being past feelings have given themselves over on the lasciviousness to work all on cleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He said, listen, don't live like the way you used to live. and Don't like to live like the world. You're different. You're a child of God. You're a child of heaven. Our gaze is up there, not down here. And the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. 
And so the first word we find here is mortify, kill, put to death, sin before it harms you, kills you. The second word that we see here, the little phrase, is simply put off. Look at verse number eight. But now ye also put off all these. And then he gives another list which we're going to go through. But look at verse 9, because it's interesting. In the last part of verse 9, it says, Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. In other words, that's our position. That's something that has already happened. In other words, you have already, you're already dead. You, in positionally with God, have already put off the old man with his deeds. And so now, in a practical way, we should live up to that position. Our practice should match our position. Now look, as we close, look at verse number 8 now. He says, but now ye also put off all these. Now I, I looked at that. And in the Greek, the word put off means to put off. But it's kind of like, it's like putting off your clothes. It means to, it means to put off. It means, you know, to shed your garments. That's what it's like. And I thought about my vast wardrobe. Um, at home and uh, oh you know I'm blessed with lots of clothes and stuff uh, some of them I've had for like 25 years but that's okay they still they still work and it's still like okay. but you know you know what it's like and you you ladies will really know what I'm talking about you know sometimes men don't really care but you're gonna you're gonna put you're gonna put an outfit on or something and then you put a jacket on and you're thinking and you look in the mirror and you're thinking nah that's I don't fancy that I used to wear that but I don't really like that anymore and so what do you do you take it off you hang it up and you go get something else, right? Now, that's the idea that he's talking about. You're put off, put on, okay? So there was a time in your life when these things that are mentioned in verse 8, uh, you were happy to wear those things. Um, at one time, you didn't mind wearing anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication and lies. But as you're looking in the mirror with those garments on, you're thinking to yourself, nah, that doesn't do anything for me. The anger, the malice, the wrath, the lies, the blasphemy. Nah, I don't like that. And you're going to take it off. Put off these things. And you're going to put on something. Look, look, next time, you'll put on another garment, which is way better than this. But it should be something that in our hearts and minds, when we evaluate and look at this garment that we're putting on, that we, hey, this is, that I used to be able to wear this. Can't wear this anymore. No. So put off. What does he say to put off? Look at verse 8. Anger. Wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Now, these, these issues seem to be um, in our, our own spirit and relationship to other people. Um, have you ever had somebody make you angry? There's not a person in here who has not been angered by someone or something or some situation. It's, it's a common emotion to humanity. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, I think it is, it says, Be ye angry and sin not. You know, there is a righteous indignation. You know, Jesus got angry. You know, God gets angry. But what about you and me? When we walk through this life and we're always angry. The book of Proverbs says, Go not with an angry man, lest I learn his ways. Have you ever been around an angry person? It's not really a, a delight, is it? It's not very pleasant. Because the person, is not he's not thankful. He's not content. He's angry all the time. Did you know that you can keep anger on the inside? And sometimes it can't be seen on the outside. Now we'll get to that next word in just a moment. But anger can be something that's on the inside, that's going on in the heart. And that's why sometimes when a man is angry with a person, it can get more. I mean, let me tell you, anger can be a very, very, very intense emotion. To the point where a man will put out a gun and kill a fellow human being because of the anger that's in his heart. It's a very, very dangerous emotion. And God says, now there's times when we, we should get angry because, you know, injustice and all of that. We should have righteous indignation. But you, got, you and I have got to really be careful with our spirit, what's going on in our mind, that we are not an angry person. Now, most times what's in a person's heart will come out. Even though they don't verbalize it, there's such a thing as body language, you know. I know when my wife is angry at me. I just know it. Someone said that where's Brother Billy? Brother Brother was talking about the look. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he says, Every man knows what the look is. Nathaniel said, Every kid knows what the look is. <laughs> That's true, you know. Um, because when anger's there, and if it's there all the time, it's going gonna, it's gonna to seep out. It's going to seep out. But the next word is a little different. The next word is wrath. 
And now ye also put off all these anger, wrath. And what's the difference between wrath and anger? The Bible talks about the wrath of God. Okay, here's what it is. God is angry with the wicked every day, but he doesn't show it. When God shows his anger, it's called wrath. Wrath is the visible manifestation. It is the outpouring. The Bible talks about the bowls of wrath that are poured out. So the wrath is being held in, held in. And then when the long suffering of God runs out, then he pours out the wrath. So the wrath is the manifestation of anger. In other words, it's, it's uh, when you blow up. It's when the gloves come off, when... Uh, you know, the the facade is gone and all that anger is poured out in words and actions and our relationships with other people. And you know what he's telling us here? Don't dress like that. Don't wear anger. Don't wear wrath. Let me tell you, anybody can be angry. Anybody can spout off. Anybody can give you a piece of their mind. Uh, when they've been provoked, any of us could do that. That's not that's not that's not uh, hard to do that. I'll tell you what the hard thing is. The hard thing is when you're provoked, and you take that thing and the emotion of it, and you say, "God, help me," and you go to God with that emotion, and you pray for that situation, and you pray for that person, and let God take the anger out. And by the way, what you're doing with that, it says. Uh, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, for vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. What you have to do with that anger is give it to God. If it's an injustice, let him deal with it. Let him fight it. He can fight it a lot better than you. Don't you don't you take matter into your own hands. Let God deal with that. But we come to God and we say, Lord, I, I'm taking off the anger. I don't want to wear this. I, I'm taking off the wrath. I don't really want to wear this. It doesn't suit me anymore. And then malice. The word malice means really to do evil to somebody. It means to hurt somebody with malice. You know, I think the law enforcement have these terms. You know, Maybe you hurt somebody, but it was unintentional. It was an accident. But if you hurt somebody with malice, it means you did it on purpose. You wanted to hurt the person. And really, it's about getting even. You're angry. You're going to manifest that anger and wrath, and you're going to get even. They are going to pay. You're going to bring some hurt to their lives. That's not your place as a Christian. We gotta, we gotta take that off. We gotta put that off. And if there's an injustice, let God deal with it. He knows how to deal with it. And then the next word is the word blasphemy. We're nearly finished. Now the word blasphemy usually we think in relationship with God, and it, spe- it means to speak evil of God, to take His name and drag it through. It means to curse God. It means to speak evil of God. We live in a world where they, they do it all the time. But the, the Greek language here, is, it, it's not, it doesn't specifically mean just toward God. The, the word simply means, the word blasphemy here simply means evil speaking. It means to speak bad about God or somebody else. And in the context here, he's speaking about our relationships with other people. And so we get angry with them. Uh, we, we blow up at them. We want to get even with them. We speak evil against them. Instead of going to that person and say, listen, i got to talk to you. And you lay it out before them. What, what passage was that, brother? Leviticus chapter 19, right? Was it 19? Brother Flanders in the revival last time, and he knew the answer. And that's where in the law it says, um, you're to love your brother. And here's what it means. If your brother offends you, you go to him and you tell him his fault. This is in Leviticus. Now, Jesus repeated it. But he says, and if you love your brother, you won't talk to somebody else about them. You will go to them and deal with them about them. But when you blaspheme then it's just gossip and you speak evil about that person. The next word there in verse 8 is filthy communications. Now, this is an amazing thing to me. Um, How many of you listen to, uh, uh, what is the radio station we listen to out in Nashville? Talk radio. 99.7. What's his name? Del Journal. How many listen to Del Journal? Okay, three of you. Okay, <laughs> there's more than that, I'm sure. And I love uh, Phil Valentine. He's a, he's a case, isn't he? He's so funny. But anyway, it's, you know, it's the main talk sta- station out of, out, of, uh, out of Nashville. Now, Del Giorno says he's a Christian. I believe he is a Christian. But he comes off with language sometimes. It just, it just stuns me. He uses unclean language that you would not use in mixed company. And he's, he's using it on the radio. 
and this is a this is a new thing in Christendom where this this uh, contemporary type idea where we kind of you know we have grace and liberty to do and we can talk any way we want to and we use profanity not, not us but I mean it's, it's it happens today believers who profess Christ and they they will use the word hell in a uh, nonchalant way they'll 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 use uh, unclean words and even profanity and um, and think nothing about it that's what this word is this word in verse number eight filthy communications means low and obscene, obscene speech it's using words that we know in our society a, 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 a good living person a, a moral person wouldn't use those words and certainly a Christian shouldn't use those words these are all low things. These are the things of this world, things on this earth, and we shouldn't be thinking about things on this earth and have affection on this world and want to identify with the dirt in this world. Our mind should be on heaven. Our affection should be on heaven. Listen, we're, we're living for the world that's coming. We're dead to this life. We're crucified to this world, and this world is crucified unto us. And then the last thing in verse number 8, or sorry, verse number 9, and it's interesting, he says, filthy communication out of your mouth. Don't let those words come in. Don't let those conversations come in. And then verse 9, he says, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. We shouldn't lie. Christians lie. See, sometimes you get in a situation where you did something wrong, and then you're challenged on it, and uh, the easy way to do it is just to kind of fudge it and, and lie your way out of it. Don't do it. That's a terrible price to pay. It's better just to fess up and be honest, because you know what will happen? Uh, what is that little phrase? Oh, what a web we weave when we plan to deceive or whatever. One lie will lead to another lie. And then you've got a whole fabrication. Then, then your whole credibility, maybe with people you love, is, is undermined by that. Go ahead and tell the truth, even if it hurts, even if they don't immediately understand it. You know, keep talking, <laughs> keep telling the truth till they understand. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. But don't lie your way out of it. You see, that's a garment that we used to wear. We used to look in the mirror and say, yeah, I'm kind of proud of that, you know. I really speak my mind. I really tell them where to go. And uh, don't mind lying about it, white lies or whatever. Don't mind wearing that. But now you're a believer. He says, put it off. Get that off. You look in the mirror and think, I can't wear that. I can't wear that. See, here's the thing. None of these garments will be worn in heaven. And God doesn't want you wearing them down here either. And so may we not be found dressed in these ugly garments of this world and things beneath and things below and things of the gutter and things of this world, dirt and filth. That's not what the Christian should be. We have a higher calling. And so he says, mortify therefore your members. Kill this thing. And these things that you used to wear, put it off, put it off. There's new garments to wear. They're way better. And God wants to change our lives from the inside out. But he says, we're dead to this world, but we're alive to the world that's coming. Kill the dead man. We are dead. Our life is hid. We're waiting. But we can wait because the best is yet to come. You don't have to have everything in this life. Moses didn't. He didn't enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He was willing to bear the reproach of Christ because he considered the, the recompense of the reward that's coming. Live for eternity. You'll never regret it. You'll never regret it. But I'll tell you this as we close. If we get involved in these things in our lives, you will reg you'll regret it there. Now, you're still saved, and you'll go to heaven, but you'll regret it there. But I'll tell you what, you'll regret it here before you get there. Because some, some men's sins are open beforehand. Some men's sins are hidden, but will we'll be later. But sin will rack us. And so what he's saying in Colossians, this is what you have in Christ. You're complete in him. You're forgiven all trespasses. You're, listen, your uh, legally binding document of indebtedness and debt is nailed to his cross. And he says, pet and food. This is what he has done for This is what you have in Christ. And so he has provoked our love and we love him he's writing the people that want to please the lord and he's just saying this is how you do it be very careful with the decisions that we make and let god help us to live for eternity let's bow together for prayer father thank you for this night grateful for the truth of your word we pray you bless us lord 
Help us not to forget these things. Lord, when temptation comes, and it comes to all of us, help us to nip it in the bud. Little sins will lead to big sins. And we've got to kill it before it kills us. Help us, Lord, to be mindful of these things. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.